It is going to be the title of the next book that we are planning. And law and happiness can be a tremendous idea as to how the law can promote the happiness and well-being in the society. And if this is deconstructed and decoded, it can lead to a very significant contribution. So we can afford to have some smile on our faces, though this is the last time going to be. I'm just uh, doing a very small thing, you know, with this uh, small presentation. And it is little away from uh, the context that uh, we just had in terms of uh, three, four presentation in the morning. You know, uh, I initially decided to speak on criminalization uh, when uh, I discussed with Professor Nore. And then I realized that I am highly occupied in the things that I won't be able to devote sufficient time. So I tried to took a very rather simple topic to be able to speak on and to do justice with the topic. So we th I thought that uh, wrongful prosecution is something that we are recently engaged in with the team sitting here. And then when I, I also looked at the context that you have portrayed for this workshop, I realized that uh, it really doesn't fit well if I start explaining the wrongful prosecution in terms of uh, the specific cases, what happened to them, why they are happening. It, it doesn't lead to the context in which we are talking. So I am experimenting with an idea which is very unique and privately not done because I have scanned the literature meanwhile and, and, and whatever is available. So how the wrongful prosecution can be explained and understood by applying the critical you know, theory framework. This is what I am trying to venture into. And I'll, I have picked up uh, a couple of theoretic, theoretical references and th theoretical you know, dialogues which I thought relevant to this discussion. So I am doing three things. First, I am just telling briefly what do I mean by wrongful prosecution, though it is all known. And second, I would be dealing with uh, key propositions in my paper in terms of uh, certain flat statements attributing certain theoretical framework relating to the nature of criminal law and nature of institutions in criminal law. You know, the wrongful prosecution for the purpose of this discussion means the instances where the accused are exonerated by the judiciary and it is about those accused who have been released as accused, tried and incarcerated for a substantial period of time ranging from few months to more than two decades and maybe 25 years and labeled as terrorists. So I am talking about wrongful prosecution in the context of terror laws in India. And then I am also trying to answer a couple of questions through a very reflective analysis on the subject. But I am not dealing wrongful prosecution in this presentation as an episodic occurrence, something which has happened on account of technical error, or on account of wrong judgment, or on account of, uh, you know, implic implicating somebody into the trap of criminal law and like that. I am posing a question, I am posing a hypothesis that it is a structural outcome. It is something inherent in the nature of criminal law and in the criminal process which give rise to the likelihood of many people get implicated into the process of criminal law and what happens. That is my main you know, position. And I am also trying to understand what meanings are attributed by the doers in their indulgence in wrongful prosecution. What kind of meanings do they derive? They means the law enforcement agencies, prosecutors, and the when somebody is, because three things are very explicit in wrongful prosecution. One is, in majority of the cases, uh, the people of a particular class have been targeted, they have been arrested <coughs> wrongfully, they have been put into custody beyond a legitimate period of time, they have been tortured, evidences have been manipulated. So a lot of aberrations and deviation from the normative process took place in the process. So I am again posing the questions, what meanings are attributed by the doers in their indulgence? Because the doers have, their, have got their own justification for their indulgence. And those justifications are very peculiar. And they sometimes relate to what Paul Robinson, now I am referring a theoretical reference here, 
So wrongful prosecution, if you understand in episodic term that there is a by design impl implicating somebody. But if I look at uh, the, uh, I, I have recently read a book, uh, Criminal Law Conversations, a very interesting book by Paul Robinson. He is undertaking a discussion on two counts and I am trying to refer that discussion in my understanding and in my explanation to the wrongful prosecution as something which I'm dealing with. So in criminal law conversation by Paul Robinson, he is raising two types of uh, debates. One is he's saying there is a thing called empirical desert. And other he's saying deontological justice. Now, so he is saying deontological justice gives a very clear position where normative ethical position that judges the morality of an action based on rules. So as long as law is concerned, the terror laws do provide a lot of leverage to the police in terms of utilizing, utilizing their discretion uh, to a great extent. So a lot of things happen because wide discretion is available to the law enforcement agencies. So to what extent this deontological justice is becoming functional in our understanding of wrongful prosecution at this stage. Second issue is empirical desert, which is of a more practical side of the application of the criminal law, which is characterized by its efficiency in terms of accelerating the processes like arrest. Because see, it is very difficult to criminal law. If more and more people are arrested, if more and more people are convicted, criminal law is presumed to be effective. Now this so-called effectiveness of criminal law becomes a kind of part of ideology of the doers and the person who indulges it. So their perception, so their perceived effectiveness of criminal law lies in these kind of notions. So according to their attribution, they are doing something good for the society because they are doing empirical desert. Empirical desert means community's sense of justice. So community's sense of justice, which is the shared notion of justice. So people will feel happy, like we have seen in Ganga Jal. So police got instrumental, guided by the people's notion, putting Ganga Jal into the eyes of the people. Now this is this is a kind of efficiency which which is somehow put into or drilled into the minds of the law enforcers. Now we need to do some theorization on this part because you know the, the, the deviance has also got serious theoretical underpinnings. So we need to understand what meanings are derived by the doers in their indulgence of this and kinds which go quite contrary to the legal notions of justice. And my second part is also which is very interesting that involvement of a particular religious category in most cases because all these cases in which wrongful prosecution was identified because this is not something debatable because judiciary has identified that these cases are in the category of wrongfully prosecuted people they have been, you know, manipulated, the evidences have been manipulated, they have been wrongfully arrested, they have been put in a kind of duress for uh, confession their uh, crimes and all that. So all these things are the part and parcel of. But I am finding a particular religious category in most cases also a smack of selective enforcement of terror laws. Now this selective enforcement of terror laws is something which is very important and let us see how these things. So I am also looking at, if we go to the fundamental structure of criminal law, uh, Ashworth and Holden, they said four propositions should meet if, if it is decided to invoke the criminal process. The, that is the minimalist approach. Minimalist approach means you are talking about the, the principle of respect for human rights, right not to be punished who succeeds. Now all these things are completely violated in case of wrongful prosecution. So now these theoretical perspectives do shed a lot of light in terms of this and also success. Criminalization should be the last resort. The last resort principle becomes, so here the police is taking criminal law as a first resort. So this dichotomy of first resort and last resort 
is at play as far as wrongful prosecution is because we are very quick we are too much interested in making the people arrested we are too much interested in people in bringing the people to the jail in putting the people to trial so now this minimalist approach which is the fundamental principle uh, you know propagated by ashwat is something which is important now so this strict state type authoritarian criminal law has got inherent vulnerability of this kind of uh, because condemnation and punishing the people is in the nature of the criminal law now another thing is happening i know i have few minutes but i will take another few minutes public dimension of criminal law is being taken over by the state centric criminal law now let us so two things are happening that criminal law is increasingly becoming the liability creating law rather than right conferring criminal law because of which we are finding that people are thinking criminal law is burden i think it can become instrumentality through which lot of rights can be achieved which is not happening now that that focus is missing because i am saying the promotion of efficiency in criminal law is defined by arrest prosecution and conviction that is the main casualty and therefore what is found is depersonalization of criminal law is happening depersonalization of criminal law happening means the personhood is getting removed from the uh, canvas of the criminal therefore offender is becoming a type and anti social conducting is becoming a type so therefore this is the end of casualty which is you know you know happening uh, if we can look at a little bit of the institution and their ideology this is this wrongful prosecution we find that in so far as criminal law has been transformed into mode of regulation it has been transformed into species of police rather than law so it has become police law rather than the people's law and most aberration on the part of police are attributable to the pliability of the terror related legislation and we find that that criminal law in this particular sense what marcus tower you know he said essential dangerousness and this incapacitist nature of criminal law so we think that these are the instrumentalities which are uh, you know becoming relevant in this discussion now last part is about you know uh, we think, think that in all events of uh, wrongful prosecution what is missing what husak says there should be compelling justification for invoking criminal process this is very important principle now if you analyze the wrongful prosecution you will find the compelling justification for invoking criminal process are always missing i don't have time to elaborate on this point but this can become also very important position the next proposition is wrongfulness of criminal process is an expression of frustration with the observance of normative law process <coughs> it gives rise to in instrumentalist criminal law because the law enforcers think that the criminal law is merely the instrumentalist criminal law because probably the meaning of constitutive and functional criminal laws are being relegated into background and instrumentalist notion of criminal law is you know dominating now this proposition can also have lot of potential to explain the instances of wrongful prosecution in india and last point that i wish to say is again in the husserl's thesis where he say already punished enough this expression is very important already punished enough is very important in wrongful prosecution when judiciary exonerates a person that he has already punished enough and let us now get rid of it now already punished enough is a form of stigmatization now stigmatizing function of criminal law is not really acquiring much space in our discussion even if does not result into conviction even if it results into exoneration the point remains lot of you know damage to dignity has already happened so criminal law in the protection of dignity 
even at this stage of exoneration is something which, which is a very serious theoretical debate. And people are happy because when we met people, they are celebrating that finally they have been acquitted. I said the kind of stigmatizing function which has already taken place and how you can get rid of them. So I think that leveling dimension in criminal law is also happening. And last I don't have time to say, Kraska and Brent, they have gone on explaining a lot of things which deal with criminal justice as politics and criminal justice as ideology. I don't have really time, but there is a huge scope of expanding these theoretical frameworks in an understanding a lot of aberrations that police are indulging in in the form of uh, wrongful prosecution or custodial torture and all those things. Thank you very much. Okay.